Good morning. It is a joy to be with you in this way uh, today. I do have some announcements we need to make about uh, the future of worship at the Shalbina Methodist Church. We gathered this week as a board, and we, we looked into what, what does it make sense for us to do in these coming days, and uh, taking into advice, the, uh, taking the guidance of our bishop, who told us, uh, follow the guidance of your local health officials, what we have decided is, we are going to continue to have these videos and the, the letter form used for the foreseeable future. And that on the 24th, we will gather outside to have worship. We'll gather in the parking lot. Now we're doing that outside because to gather inside would require face masks and we could not sing. It is the best of our understanding right now that uh, this virus can be transmitted from the, the moisture that we exhale just from the nature of talking and especially singing uh, can fill a room when uh, especially an enclosed room can fill an enclosed room and that increases greatly the risk where if one person has the virus and is in that 14 day incubation period before they have symptoms and that can be passed to another person. And so being outside is the way that we can not have face masks, not have that build up of, of those that exhaled moisture and be able to, so we can worship outside, sing, not have to deal with face masks. We'll, be, we'll sit six feet apart, six feet apart being, uh, if I reach out and there's another guy next to me and he reaches out and if we can barely touch fingertips, that's six feet. And so if we'll do about an arm reach, an arm reach plus a bit, and, and that should be sit a little bit over six feet and that's how we'll approach that. And then as you come to worship, We'll have a station, two stations, I believe, is what we'll do, where you can walk up, there'll be a hand sanitizer, uh, so you sanitize your hands, and you can pick up a sheet that will have the lyrics for the hymns of the day, and there'll be an offering plate there if you'd like to make an offering. And so I think that's, uh, that, that's our plan. Uh, well, I don't think, that is our plan. We'll begin that on the 24th, and we will continue to do that until the guidelines change and we can look at what we do next. It is entirely possible that over time the guidelines will change so that we can resume worshiping inside. It is also possible that the guidelines will change and we'll have to modify even, even worshiping outside. We, we just don't know yet. But this is uh, what we're looking at as a church. So we'll continue to have videos every weekend, letters sent out to those without internet, and on the 24th we'll begin to have uh, outside worship. I look forward to seeing you there greatly. The Word of God is read this day uh, by Adam Ratley. Please uh, join with me as we listen. Jesus Revisits Nazareth When Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there. He came to his hometown and began teaching them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? When did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. In these weeks following Easter, we've been contemplating some of the questions that naturally occur in, in light of the resurrection. And the one we'll be looking at today is the question of, if Jesus is resurrected, how come everyone doesn't believe in him? It seems like a reasonable question to ask. He has uh, done a set of miracles in front of the, the 12 disciples, and they have gone on to, to found the church, this institution, this organization that has lasted for centuries, has outlasted anything else that has existed since then, something that I believe is possible due to the power of the Holy Spirit. And um, there are plenty of witnesses to what happened. Why doesn't everyone believe? 
Now, what is actually surprising, if we read the Gospels closely, is not only do people not believe today, but if you go back into Jesus' day, there are people who did not believe him then as well. And so we're going to look at that today as a way to begin to, to think through how do we ask this question? How do we answer, if we can't answer, how is it that people do not believe? Well, and the way we're going to do this is we're going to read Matthew 13, when Jesus goes to his hometown. And so what happens in Matthew 13 is that Jesus shows up at his hometown, and I'm sure he is offering them the same thing he has been offering to every other community he, he serves, he shows up at. He is telling them, uh, hear the good news, the, the kingdom of God has come near. Receive these signs, these gifts, these miracles that are point towards the kingdom. Follow me, here we go, the kingdom will come in its fullness. That's kind of the summation of what he is teaching. How do we act as citizens in this kingdom that is to come? And he offers them this gift, but they do not choose to unwrap it. And a gift, well, you can't force someone to unwrap a gift, or else then it's not really a gift. That's what happens in this hometown. The people of Jesus' hometown hear Jesus proclaiming the good news at the synagogue, and they cannot hear, for they struggle with what they already know. And what they know is, this is that lad we grew up with. This is Joseph's boy. This is Mary's son. We know his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, and, and his sisters, right? We know his sisters. And they get stuck on that, and they cannot see that there is more happening, more happening in Jesus. They ask twice, like, where did this man get all of this? They're very confused by what's happening. They don't see what Jesus is offering as a gift, and so they do not accept what it is that he offers. Jesus, who has come to his hometown, we are told, he does not do any deeds of power because of their unbelief. Now, I don't believe that means that their unbelief hamstrung Jesus somehow, because Jesus, well, the whole resurrection, people didn't believe that was going to happen, and it did. And so it's not that Jesus' ability to do things is based upon our belief whether he can. My understanding would be that it is their unbelief that means they don't ask. And so Jesus does not do anything to point to the kingdom, any miracles, any healings, anything like that. Because if all you see is the seven-year-old Jesus, and, and you see this grown man, but still you're still focused on it being that seven-year-old Jesus who ran down the streets, uh, you're not going to go to that person and ask for help. And if they don't ask, you don't accept what they're offering, then nothing happens. So I don't take this as a comment upon Jesus' power. I take this as a comment upon the way that if you're not willing to accept help, you're not going to receive help, receive this gift that Jesus offers. Now, Jesus being, you know, Jesus, the best teacher that has ever taught, his hometown did not learn because they did not want to. They chose not to. And uh, this is not the only time that something like this happens in Scripture. We, we see, for example, uh, what happens to try to avoid this. Back in the 8th century B.C., in, in the Old Testament time period, we read of the, the prophets Amos and Hosea, who both are in the 8th century, as I said, and Amos Amos grows up in southern Judah and goes to northern Israel to, to proclaim the, 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 the news of God. And then Hosea, who grows up in northern Israel, goes south to Judah to do the same. There's this sense they could not have been heard in their hometown, this, just like what happened to Jesus, trying to avoid that. And so Jesus does not get listened to, but he does not rant, he does not condemn. And I believe he has prepared the disciples for what's about to happen. If you look at chapter 13 of Matthew, I think you'll see what I'm talking about. In the 13th chapter of Matthew, at the end of the chapter we have this story we've just been grappling with when Jesus visits his hometown. Earlier in the chapter, in verse 24 and following, we hear this parable that Jesus tells his disciples, this parable about how the kingdom of God can be compared to a field in which good seed has been sown and then bad seed has been sown. And the decision has to be made about what to do about this. And the master replies, 
let us not gather the harvest. For the wheat, the good seed, needs time to grow. And so just wait. We're not going to do anything now. And this ex parable is explained a few verses later. And it is said that the wheat, the good seed, that's the children of the kingdom of God. They're going to bear this great fruit, right? the fruit of a life well lived. And while the, the weeds are the, the children of the evil one, and then the harvest is at the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. It is a parable of grace, a parable of patience, a parable of not expecting everything to be perfect and being willing to wait to judge until the end, not being certain about anyone's fate until it's all over. The disciples hear this, and they are contemplating this, kicking it around as they enter Jesus' hometown. I am sure that they expected something different than what happened. They expected Jesus to be well-received, and that's not what happened. Jesus was not well-received. I do not know for certain what happened that night as they left, or whatever time it was that they left, but I'm guessing that they went back to that parable and hashed it over again. Wait a minute, Jesus. Let's talk again about this whole hometown thing and the wheat and the weeds. What's going on? And I can guess they had a long conversation about patience, about the waiting that happens in that parable, that glimpse, a parable being a glimpse of how the kingdom of God works. <clears throat> what is the patience for, Jesus? Why, why are we waiting? What I would like to suggest is that the patience, the waiting, the grace to wait until the end to judge the, the harvest, that is a patience that is both for the wheat and for the weeds. The weeds, it, the hope for them is that by the grace of God, the weeds might be changed. The weeds might become wheat. The weeds might see something to make them reconsider, and they might become something different. And the patience, the grace for the wheat, well, wheat doesn't grow up and grow a crop overnight. It takes time. It takes time for the fruit to grow. I, I was looking into this and I found out that the fruit of wheat, that the kernel, the, the fruit is actually called a caryopsis, which was a, a, it's a fun term. But uh, the, you have, there had, the patience for the wheat is, is so that it might be able to produce a harvest, a harvest that is good simply because having a harvest is good, but also because having such a harvest shows the wheat, the wheat shows, having the, by having this harvest shows the weeds that there is a better way, a, a, a way that leads to a better outcome. And so the patience in the parable of the wheat and the weeds is a patience with a purpose, a patience that is directed towards a better future, a patience that trusts that while the gr wheat grows its fruit, that there will be such an abundant crop that will be grown that the weeds will see and consider changing their ways. A parable is meant to tease the brain and to challenge us to think. And we know that Jesus came that we might all have life and have it more abundantly. And so the patience with the weeds is not, ju it's not just about the wheat growing its fruit. It's about having patience so that the weeds might reconsider and the weeds might become wheat. And that includes even, I'm sure the disciples were told, these people of Jesus' hometown. Now, by no means does this downplay the change that is being considered here. To change from weeds to wheat, to change from not following Jesus to following Jesus is quite the change. Right? To see some, we, we are as humans equipped naturally when we see something new to interpret it in light of what we already know. We see someone who grew up in a hometown and we say, ah, they're probably just like they always were growing up. And these people of the hometown, they had a hard time seeing Jesus. Jesus as more than the small boy they had previously known. And so uh, we have to ask, what does it take for someone to change what they have seen before? Well, it, it takes something significant. It takes something seen over time. It takes some real evidence, right? And, and this is something, you know, I, I have seen changing in Northeast Missouri 
over the last decade and a half. And it might be a small example, but I still think it gets at it. When I moved here a decade and a half ago, I noticed uh, that I never saw anyone driving a foreign-made truck. I saw F-150s and Chevy Silverados, and that was about it. And over the last 15 years, I've started to see people driving something other than a Chevy or other than a Ford truck. Why is that? What changed? Well, over the course of year after year after year, it became clear that maybe Toyota is not a bad truck to drive. All right, that's the type of thing we're talking about. You had to see some fruit. You had to see something over time make a difference to be willing to consider next time I go shopping for a truck, maybe I will go look at a Toyota or a Mazda or, or something else. I think that's what this parable helps us to see, that the, the wheat um, is growing that grain, that fruit, it grows it for an entire season, and it is is a consistent fruitfulness that then the weeds can see and, and reconsider. It is an interesting thought experiment to then kick around, like what would have happened if Jesus had stayed at his hometown for a while? How long would it have taken for his, the people he grew up with to see him differently? It would have taken some time. And so to go back to the original question, why doesn't everyone believe? I don't know if I can give you a definitive answer. What I can tell you is that it has been a challenge ever since Jesus has been walking around. And I can further say that it was a challenge that Jesus faced himself. That this is the way, this is the way that Jesus responds, talking, teaching this parable of wheat and weeds, that there is patience so that both might have a chance to grow, the wheat to grow its crop, the weed to reconsider its way, and that there is not judgment until the very end. Why doesn't everyone believe? I cannot tell you, but what I can tell you is that there is a great patience, the patience that Jesus shows to the people of his hometown, this patience that he asks us to show with each other, so that over time the fruit of a life well lived, the fruit of a long faithfulness following Jesus might be displayed to others, such that by showing other people the way that Je following Jesus changes our life, people may begin to believe that which they might not otherwise believe. That is in the end the calling of, of the way that we, we live as Christians. We live so that those who cannot believe that Jesus tells the truth by watching us will learn that indeed it is only because Jesus tells the truth that we can dare live this way. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let me invite you to bow your heads and pray with me. Lord, in this time, we pray for your patience. We pray that uh, just as you taught your disciples patience, you would teach us the same patience with ourselves as we seek to grow the fruit of a life well lived, patience with others who do not follow you. We pray that the fruit of our lives, both our actions and our words, be such that others will stop and consider what makes such a life of grace and peace possible. In this time when so many churches are deciding about their future, we pray for wisdom for this church and for each church that we might decide and trust each other. We pray for those facing the daily decisions which truly are life and death, whether it be those in the healthcare field or those who are in leadership making decisions that will impact countless lives. We pray for those who are alone, while they're alone at home or alone in the hospital. We pray for your spirit to move and for these folks who we love to be sustained in these very hard and challenging times. Amen. May the peace of Jesus Christ be with you this day and always, and I look forward to seeing you soon.